we'll give another minute because I know there, there's going to be a lot of a lot of questions and a good Q and A. That's always kind of the best part. So I want to make sure you have enough time to go over things. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we go go ahead and get started? I'm sure some people will keep joining us. Um, so I'm Jordan Fry uh, from the Prudent Plastic Surgeon, and I'm excited to have uh, Catherine Sarnoski with us again. She is an OBGYN and the Chief Medical Officer of uh, Contract Diagnostics and a wealth of information around uh, contract everything, contract review, contract negotiations uh, for physicians. And this is something that I just went through again recently. I just renegotiated my contract. I used contract diagnostics to help me with that, um, specifically the Compensation RX um, tool, which I found incredibly useful. So this is stuff I think is really important. Um, and so I always learn a ton from Catherine as well. And without further ado, Catherine, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. And um, anyone certainly feel free, you know, chime in with any questions or put them in the chat box. We'll definitely have time at the end to kind of have a back and forth as well. So Catherine, take it away. Thanks so much, Jordan. I appreciate being here tonight and thank you all for joining. This is an overview of physician contracts a review of some of the main terms that you're going to be seeing, a little bit about how to negotiate, how to renegotiate, like Jordan was saying. So this is meant to apply to you if you are a resident looking at jobs or if you've been in a job for a while and you're looking for a new one or you're looking to renegotiate, we should be able to touch on almost anybody's situation here. So like Jordan said, feel free to jump in with questions. It takes about 35 minutes for me to get through all of the content. Happy to answer questions along the way, or we can save them for the last 20 or so minutes and review them all then. So just to give you a little bit of background about contract diagnostics, this company was started by John Apino a little over 12 years ago, and it is a firm that specializes solely in physician contract review and negotiation. We don't do anything else. I specifically sit on, or predominantly sit on the education side. So I do a lot of these lectures at Grand Rounds. If you're looking for something for your department, please feel free to let me know. I love doing these and then come about once a year to join Jordan for this as well. Um, and then I also do some uh, contract review as well. I'm also a practicing OBGYN, as Jordan mentioned. I worked in academics. I've worked in private practice. I worked as a locums. I'm just going back into the traditional contract position or um, the traditional employed world again. So going through my own contract at the moment. So I've been through a lot of this and we've reviewed a lot of different types of contracts before. So hopefully everybody finds something to take home from this tonight. We're going to go through the whole pot process of receiving a contract, going through the negotiations, mostly going through a lot of the terms, compensation, and then we'll talk a little bit about red flags and risks associated with the contracts. Um, like I mentioned, it doesn't matter what level of your training or practice you are in. Hopefully everybody finds something useful in this. So in terms of starters, of uh, what to expect and how to get a contract, once you've identified some jobs, which I know is a process in and of itself, but once you've identified a job, really your first step is going to be the site visit. That all goes well. You may get a letter of intent. And then if you sign that, you're moving on to the contract and we'll go through that section by section. And then once you've been with an organization for a while, you may want to look into renewal of that contract and renegotiation of that contract. So it will go through each of those areas. Site visit was where everything begins. That's your first opportunity to start negotiating, maybe without some of the paperwork or the details, but this is your chance to ask as many questions as you can think of. Get to know the team, get to know the resources, the hospital, the clinic, the community. If you're gonna be moving there by yourself or with family, understanding school systems, trail systems, whatever strikes your fancy, um, making sure that that's a good fit for you. If you notice anything missing that you are hoping for, this is a great chance to start asking questions like if you work in the OR, for example, and they don't carry one of the instruments that you're most comfortable with, what's the process for requesting this kind of a new instrument? Is this possible? What steps are we taking? Getting some information like that. Asking about schedule, details, details. The one thing 
I really encourage people not to talk about at this visit. If they give you information, great. But if they ask you what you are expecting for compensation, trying to defer that question until you have all of your information, since the number doesn't tell you everything, there is so much more that goes into it in terms of what they're offering, what the benefits are. And so just politely deferring that question. And you can say something like, I'm sure it's going to be something um fair, I, you know, I'd like to review the whole contract so that I can have a better idea of the picture. Um, when things go well, about one in five times, you'll get a letter of intent. So this is their, uh, the group, the employer saying that they're ready to move forward, that they to make you an offer. And they'd like to see that you are feeling positively as well. So generally what this is going to outline is your compensation, your relocation and signing bonuses, maybe student loan repayments, um, might have some of your benefit information like PTO, CME, your start date. We'd like to encourage everybody that once you receive the letter of intent, since this is something that you are signing, we do recommend getting a contract review specialist on your team at this point. When you sign this contract, generally it'll say on there that, you know, this isn't the contract, it's not binding, but everything that's in there is going to be transcribed over to the contract itself. So once you've signed this, they assume that you're content with everything that's in this letter, that you're comfortable with that compensation, you're comfortable with the signing bonus. Doesn't mean you can't go back and renegotiate it, but it does make it more challenging if you haven't had those questions up front. So we really do encourage asking tons of questions at this point, and then making sure that you're on board with all the information that you've gathered thus far and that you feel comfortable seeing that in the contract. Once you get that contract, generally they're anywhere from, I've seen them anywhere from two pages up to 79 pages. Um, the average is probably in that 10 to 18 page range, which is sufficient, but they can fit a lot of details into that. There are by far more than five sections in the contract, but I do want to go through the five heavy hitters. Doesn't mean you want to skip or ignore the other ones, but I do want to mention these in a little bit more detail so that you feel familiar with them when you start to review your own. So the position and expectations is generally going to be giving a, more information about what you are offering them. And then the rest of the contract will talk a little bit more about what they're offering you. So this is where they're going to um, spell out how many hours you're supposed to be working, or if you're full-time or part-time, you have clinical or 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 call responsibility, what that will all look like. If you're doing research or admin, as much detail as possible, we really encourage having in this subsection. Um, this is going to kind of dictate your day-to-day -day life and well-being at the at work. And so when it says something just like full time, what does that mean? If right now you have six people in your group, full time might not be so bad. Maybe it's three or four days a week in the clinic and then that one in six call. But as I imagine many of you have seen, these group sizes can change dramatically and quickly. So if you go down to three partners, now full time maybe is all five days a week in the clinic and one in three call, and you didn't have any boundaries set in that. Um, contract. So try to get that all spelled out as best you can. Try to set caps if you can, you know, if it's going to be more than one in six, anything extra is going to be compensated additionally. What would that look like? If you can get that negotiated ahead of time, then you don't need to be doing it on the spot once you're in a little bit more of a bind and signed with them. If you can get any specifics about location, that's another, you know, set your primary practice location so they can't start opening clinics elsewhere and having you drive two hours or 45 minutes or in opposite directions from where you live or the hospital, if that's not something that you are hoping to, to do or planning to do. And then compensation. So I'm going to spend probably the bulk of the time on this because I know it's everybody's favorite. Um, but I do want to reiterate that while it's important, it's not the only thing that has a monetary value to it. So we'll spend time on the other sections that we're going to review as well. Um, but just so you're familiar with some of the different structures, depending on which practice you're, you're applying to or you're working in, um, I just want you to be familiar with what each of these means. So we'll talk about the salaried structure only. Um, for anybody who's a resident looking for a new job, this is most likely the, the structure that you're going to see. And then certain areas like hospitalists, um, OBGYN laborists, ER docs, a lot of them will oftentimes see salaried models as well. So this is setting a 
fixed rate that could be your hourly rate. It could be a shift based rate, or it could just give you your yearly rate. And then it lists how much you're doing during that time. So say it's $250,000 a year. That is it. It doesn't matter if you, um, for some reason, you know, you show up for all your shifts and the whole year, you only see a hundred patients or you show up for all your shifts and you have 3000 patients in that time. You get that rate no matter what. Sometimes they'll build in a bonus. So if you do have some production component and you exceed your production, then you'll get your salary, that 250,000 plus now you're getting a little extra bonus on the back end because you did more, saw more patients or did more procedures than they originally had you planned for. Um, and then the shift rate, the hourly rate, that's what you'll oftentimes like the ER docs, hospitalists, laborists will oftentimes see those. So let's say they're in 24 hour shifts. Every 24 hours is $3,000, something like that. It doesn't matter what you do. It's just paid more for your time. An RVU model or a WRVU, the work RVUs, is a model set by Center for Medicare and Medicaid, and it's looking at your production, and it gives everything a value. So any procedure you do, any patient you see, when you put that billing code in, that's going to be associated with an RVU. So for an OBGYN, for example, if I do a C-section, I might, making up these numbers, might get 10 RVUs versus if I do a vaginal delivery, I might get five RVUs. And then the end, so that's going to be the same wherever I'm working. But what's going to be different is the conversion factor. So that's what where my employer is going to decide how much um, value to give each of those RVUs. So usually you're seeing somewhere between $40 to $70 per RVU. Um, so if you have a production-based model, every time you see a patient and you bill and you get, get those RVUs associated with you, you might, your paycheck then is just going to be based off of that conversion factor times the RVUs. So it's a production-based model. Um, an example of this is if you have one of those salary plus bonus thresholds, you could do $200,000 a year base salary. Let's say you are expected to hit 4,000 RVUs in that, but you go over that. Well, now you're going to get 44 bucks an RVU on top of that. Great. So you're going to bring home a little bit more than 200,000 if you exceed that 4,000. Couple different things you can negotiate if these are up for numbers that are up for negotiation. One, bump your base salary. Um, try to get to 210, 220. Two, you could try to increase that conversion factor if that's not set across a, um, a large system, then you might be, be able to negotiate that RVU. Maybe you can get it up to $54 per RVU. Um, or you can drop your threshold. So instead of having to exceed 4,000, let's only exceed 3,500, 3,800, something like that. You can also find tiered models. Some of these are pre-built. Some of these we negotiate in for our physicians, but that could be something like um, any RVU from 4,000 to 4,500 is going to be $44 in RVU. Anything from 4,500 to 5,000 is going to be $54 in RVU. 5,000 and beyond, $64 in RVU. Essentially incentivizing you to do more work if that's something of interest to you. So those are a couple of other options to keep in mind depending on your contract model. Collections-based model is pretty much only seen in private practices. And this is different from the RVU in the sense that this is what comes back to the clinic and then what portion of that you get. So the RVUs, if you do the work, doesn't matter if the employer or the, the patient um, or insurance company pays, you still generated the RVUs. So you're getting paid for that. Collections, on the other hand, is what actually comes back to you. So you put in that billing, you bill the patient for that C-section, she's supposed to pay $10,000 and never pays. Well, you're not going to get paid anything for that. Let's say she gets her $10,000, she sends it back. Now what you're going to have to do is cover from that your overhead. Um, so when you're in your private practice, you might have a building that you're paying a mortgage on. You are going to have your MAs, your nurses, um, your front desk staff that you have to help cover their salaries. And generally this will all be written into your contract. So you know what your overhead looks like. Try to keep that as low as possible. You know, try to see if you can bring that down so that, because whatever is left over after that is generally what you're going to get to take home. Um, so those are different things to be thinking about when you're looking at a private practice. Um, they do have some, like for new docs, a lot of times you'll get that base salary as you're joining the practice. And just so you can build your, your patient base, build your practice, 
So let's say it's that 200,000 and then anything over 400,000 collected, you'll get 30% of that. Great, again, you can negotiate up that base salary, up that percentage of the collections or decrease that threshold from 400,000 down. Again, you can aim for tiers. Um, and as you spend more time at that practice, if you can find ways to drop that overhead, that's gonna benefit you and all of your partners in terms of what your take home will be. And then we're starting to see a lot more um, quality-based incentives. There was a thought and sort of still is a thought at this point that most of the contract physician contracts are going to start having their compensation more based off of quality. We have not seen that shift by any means yet, but we do see a lot of quality bonuses. So those are great to know. If you have the chance of generating an extra 20 or $30,000 a year for your quality incentive, awesome. But what you want to know is, can you actually get it? So what are the um, expectations in order to achieve that? And sometimes they're really obtainable, straightforward. You can track them. Like, are you closing your charts within 24 hours? Are you um, showing up to your quarterly meetings? Like things that you have control over. Um, great. Then as long as you know what those are, then you can meet those metrics. If you... Um, sometimes they'll have metrics that you have no control over. So it could be something like the patient reviews for the clinic. Well, there might be 10 providers in that clinic, including nurse practitioners and PAs, and you've got a grouchy front desk person or something like that. And so the patients rate you great, but they rate some of the other areas, the cleanliness, something like that, not so great. And so it brings down your value and you're not meeting that metric as well, but you don't have control over it. That's important to know. So one of the questions you can ask simply is how many of the providers receive this bonus and how much of the bonus do they actually get? Are they getting 30,000 or 28 or 29, you know, getting really close or are they getting zero to 5,000? That's important to know, especially as you're figuring out your budgeting, your life, your investing, your savings, like you don't want to count on a $30,000 paycheck at the end of the year that never shows up. So just another thing to keep in mind. When it comes to figuring out pay and whether or not it's fair, that's what we want to know. There's a lot of different ways of thinking about that. Um, the story, you know, the reason that you are looking at this job is important. It matters. What are you bringing to them? Do you have a particular niche that they're you're fulfilling? Have they had this job posted for three years and they haven't found anyone for this? Is this a really rural practice where you're going to be on call almost 24 seven or one in two? There's a lot of different information there. So it's not like one cardiology position in Michigan is going to necessarily pay the same as like rural Idaho or something like that. We, we can't assume that. So there are ways to have an idea of what you can expect and what might be normal. Some of those are the survey studies that come out. Some of them are every year, some of them are every few years. MGMA is the most common that comes out every year. That is a data set that we at Contract Diagnostics do purchase so that we can provide that to our physicians. Um, it's not really accessible on your own. Otherwise, it's very expensive to purchase. Um, the AAMC is the academic set. That is if you work at an institution or if you're a resident at a um, at an academic institution, your library might have that. It only comes out about every three years. And then academic salaries are also, if their state employees are also posted online, although they don't always give the full picture. Sullivan Cotter is another one that you might hear. I actually have a blog that goes through all of these in a little bit more detail if you're just curious about what the differences are between them. Um, but the other thing is, you can just, if you're up for it, you can interview across your town, the country, wherever you're interested in and looking for and compare and see what's out there. So you can try to, you know, give yourself a picture of what seems fair. Are all of these jobs offering 350 a year? And then this one is only 170 or something, you know, what, what's the difference here? What are we seeing or not seeing? What are the benefit packages like from one to the next? Those have a huge value too. So it's not just that one compensation number that tells you everything, um, but that MGMA data set is generally utilized enough um, in the employer negotiations that that's a good data set to have on hand for yourself. So that is, like I said, something that we do offer 
to our physicians who are doing negotiations with us or can just be purchased individually, which is that compensation RX um, package that Jordan was talking about, which does come with a phone call too, to go through all of that information so that you're familiar with how it applies to you and your situation. But there is way, you know, there are ways to access that. We also do, just so you guys know, at contract diagnostics, we keep track of all of the data from the contracts that we review. So we do make sure that you have information about if you're a nephrologist in Oklahoma, well, we'll pull any recent nef nephrology contracts that we've um, reviewed, signed, give you all of their data as well. And generally, it, it tends to be fairly regional. So we, we try to keep it more as specific to your region as possible, too. All right. Oh, and then, so the other thing is with this, you know, when you're initially um, looking at your contract, yes, you want to go in strong. You want to get the best compensation package that you can right off the bat. So if you start strong, you can really only go up. That's the best place to be. But keep in mind, let's say you didn't think about negotiating your contract. You've been in your position for two or three years, um, hopefully not more than that without having thought about what this compensation looks like. But now you're saying, I should really look into this. I don't know if this is fair. I don't know what my partners make. I don't know what the team down the street makes relative to us. Um, that's where you can, you know, pull that compensation RX information and then be able to bring that to your employer so that you can start to renegotiate. Um, that is something that we offer our physicians. And I just like to let people know it tends to be a lengthier process and oftentimes fairly associated with your um, facilities budget cycle. So if you're at an academic institution or a bigger employer, they tend to have a budget cycle that some of them will start in July, some September, some are January 1st. But you generally, if you're going to request something that is going to affect their budget, um, they you want to get that information and start having that conversation three to six months before their budget cycle starts so that you have plenty of time to um, negotiate that with them, have it approved, and then have it set for that next budget cycle so that you're not now waiting another year, essentially, to be able to have that take effect. Um, some other sources of additional income, if you're supervising nurse practitioners or PAs, if you have medical directorship positions, um, admin time research, teaching. I used to, when I worked in academics, I did a lot of global health work. So had all that built into my contract to make sure that was protected time. That was all compensated. If you realize, yes, I'm definitely going to be having roles like this that might take a toll on my production or um, are going to increase the amount of time that I'm here at my job, make sure that you're thinking of ways to have that compensated if they're not already in there or that you're optimizing that compensation if um, that's the case. Benefits, like I was mentioning, have a huge monetary value to them. So for the last three years, I was doing all locum tenens work, which means I did not get any benefits through any employer. I had to get my own health insurance, set up my own retirement plan. There was certainly no match in in included in that. Um, I had to pay my own social security component. There's a better term for it than that, but um, the employer wasn't paying that social security component to the federal taxes. You, I had to figure out my own taxes all the time. They weren't just pulling it out for me. That had a huge cost. So that takes that's worth a lot of money. When you look at these plans that they're offering you, the life and disability insurance that they're offering you, um, the retirement, the matches, the um, vacation time, the CME funding, the CME time, all of that generally adds up to somewhere between thirty and $60,000 a year if you have a comprehensive benefits package. So we do really encourage physicians to take the time to meet with their HR department or whoever has all the information about this. And a lot of them have really well built out um, websites with all of this information. So you can just click through and see what you would want and how much that's, you know, what they're paying, what you're paying, all of that. Um, and then a lot of them are actually, when they give you your compensation, I've seen a number of places break down. Yeah, your yearly salary is 300,000, but these are all the benefits that we're paying. So it really looks like 380,000 a year or something like that. So just things to think about uh, as you are looking at these positions. I I loved doing, I love doing locums work. I absolutely do. But man, it hurts writing the checks for all of these when you don't have an employer helping to pay for any of them. Um, as an attending, you know, so just again, thinking about you've been at your job for a few years when you want to be renegotiating, 
every few years, it makes sense. I mean, we have inflation like crazy these last few years. And when we as physicians haven't been getting any raises, no bumps in our salary, we're losing money. It, you know, we're losing value to the dollar. So let's make sure to be advocating for ourselves, especially if you've spent time with an organization, you're valuable. You, they, they want to hang on to you. Some of them don't seem to always know that, but they do want to hang on to you. And they, uh, because it's expensive to lose a physician, it's very expensive to hire a new physician. So remind them what you are bringing to the organization. Think about what you've been providing to them to meet their goals, whether it's their financial goals or building out new departments, um, sitting on committees, if you've helped create this additional niche care model. Um, if you brought the ability for them to take care of higher acuity patients, you name it, just remind them of all of that. So that is something that we offer with that compensation RX is try to think about what you're bringing to the table and then looking at the current compensation data, understanding why you're asking for what you're asking for um, so that they know your story, they hear your case and they're sold on this. This is what we wanna be able to help you renegotiate that. All right. In terms of how to think about pay, um, we have a lot of PDFs. So if anybody's looking for like a quick recap of compensation or um, malpractice, as we'll get into it, some of those, just let me know. Let us know. We do send a follow-up email with a couple of them. So you don't need to memorize all these questions right now. We have a PDF that has these and more. But Generally, when we're talking about any of these sections, sometimes you don't have to just straight up negotiate. Um, you don't see the number and think, well, 350, I want 375. You don't, that doesn't have to be your first question. It can just be, where did this number come from? Find out what survey data set they're using. If you're handing them MGMA data and they're only using Sullivan Cotter and won't talk about MGMA, well, that's not helpful. Academic sets, they're going to be completely different. Ask some of these organizations will have a preset threshold for when they renegotiate or reevaluate their fair market value for physicians. So say you're on a salaried model, every you know internal medicine doc gets paid the same thing, you're never going to negotiate a different one because that's not their model. Well, how often are they going to check it? Are you going to be stuck at this? forever and ever and ever, or in two years, are they going to reevaluate? They're going to pull their survey data sets. And every two years, they just have a built-in raise, or they have a built-in um, reevaluation with anticipated raise, something like that. Or is it the longer you're with the organization? Do you get a bump? Understanding all of that, just so that you understand how they think and how they work is really helpful. And then once you get all that clarification, all that information, it's up to you to decide, yeah, sounds fair. Or nope, I'd like to ask for more based on this. Um, we're going to jump into some of the other areas that are super important because they also have a monetary value to them and a big impact on life and well-being. So I just want to, to touch on a few of these. Well, practice insurance being one of them. So as physicians, we know we run the risk of being sued. And so we need to be protected. And that's where our malpractice insurance comes in handy. Occurrence-based is the gold standard. And that is essentially saying that when you are under the policy with your employer, any patient that you take care of with that employer under that policy, you're covered. If you terminate that contract with them, you leave in three years and you get a claim against you in five years, you are covered under that policy. With a claims-based policy, you are only covered under that policy if you are still working for that employer under that policy, and that is when the claim is made. So you need to be employed by them today. You took care of a patient maybe a year ago, you get a claim, you're covered. If you leave tomorrow and you get the claim the next day, you are not covered anymore. That's where your tail insurance comes in handy. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because one, you have to have tail insurance because you want to be covered no matter when that claim happens. And two, depending on your field, tail insurance can be very expensive. I'm hypersensitive to it as an OBGYN because we have one of the highest rates of tail insurance. Um, this is ideally covered by your employer so that you are not taking on this cost. I do not want to leave a job and find out I don't have tail insurance because it could cost me anywhere from $50,000 to $180,000. That's how expensive it is. Some not so bad. I've seen some internal medicine quotes that are like ten dollars to $15,000. Still a lot. That's a, that's a big check to write in a day. Um, most people aren't expecting to do that. So you don't want to be put in that situation, but maybe not as bad as a six-figure number. But you want to know 
where this is coming from. So who's paying that tail insurance? If you can't negotiate it, it's just not happening that the employer is going to be paying that. Then you can think of ways to protect yourself. One, get your quote ahead of time. So you know what it's going to cost and you have that in a savings account or, or some sort of accessible investment bond, CD, whatever, something that you could, you could grab if you need it. Um, that will be important Two is think of ways that you could get it paid. So maybe if you're with them for three years, they'll pay it after that. Or each year that you're with them, they'll pay a portion of it. Some um, employers will do retention bonuses. So say you're with them for a few years and then you get a $60,000 bonus or something like that. Great. Now you can put that into your little tail insurance savings account and then anything that's left over, you can hang on to. So just ways to help protect yourself in that situation. Super important. Don't forget about that one. Restrictive covenants have a, um, I think, have a, can have a big impact on uh, just well-being and, and lifestyle for some physicians, depending on what you're looking for. So these are restrictions that are put on you after you leave the facility, and it's meant to protect protect your employer. Um, the non-compete is one of the most specific. So that's saying you've worked with your employer, and once you leave them for the next say we'll make up numbers here, 18 months cannot work with another employer within a 25 mile radius of your primary location, your primary location for your hospital, any place you ever had a shift with them, you name it. So you can imagine how big that blacked out region could potentially get. Now, if you're somebody like me who just loves to move on to the next state, I wouldn't care that much about a non-compete, but I know a lot of people, a lot of friends, a lot of physicians who want to stay in a very specific area. Maybe you have kids in school or your partner is a, a partner in a law firm and they don't want to leave. Um, so you don't want to suddenly now have to be driving 50 miles to get to work or taking 18 months off or, um, you know, trying to certainly don't want to try to, um, sneak in to a different practice just around the corner, just in case they come after you, because that could be very expensive. But those are important things to be thinking about. When you negotiate those non-competes, depending on your employer, they can be very restrictive. They may not touch those numbers, but you can try to shrink that radius, like I was talking about, not from a mileage perspective, but from a number of locations. So you could try to limit it to your primary location. Um, that would be the goal. Uh, if they won't do that, your primary location in the hospital or somewhere where you've brought in 80% of your product production or something like that. Just try to make it as small a radius as possible. We've also had success with um, a couple different fields getting good exclusion criteria in there. And uh, like for OBGYNs, we've been able to successfully get amendments that exclude laborist work or hospitalist work. I had a, uh, I think it was a nephrologist actually, who she was able to negotiate an exclusion that she could do general medicine, like hospitalist work um, or inpatient, just couldn't do nephrology specifically. So if she still wanted to work there. She could still practice medicine. She just wouldn't be her subspecialty for those 18 months. So a couple of things to be thinking about if you want to find some exclusions, a few standard exclusions that we generally recommend uh, having written into your contracts as well. We'd always go into that information with you um, too, if you're doing a contract review with us. Non-solicitations are just saying, don't bring your nurse, your patients, like don't advertise that you're going and try to haul the whole family with you as much as you might want to, um, that, that is frowned upon. There are some states that do not uh, uphold their restrictive covenants, Minnesota being the best one. Uh, they no, no longer recognize those federally. They're trying to get rid of, or at a national level, uh, federal government level, they're trying to get rid of them as well. So we'll see where this goes over the next couple of years still out there. Um, and if you're in a state that does not have any restrictions on restrictive covenants, please just assume that, that it's going to be a problem or, or work with an attorney if you're trying to fight it. But um, otherwise, we'll keep an eye out on what happens next. Termination. I know most physicians are not in a contract already thinking about leaving, but statistically, we know people especially new grads, new residents, um, up, upwards of 70% of them will leave the first job within the first two to three years. So, and life happens, you know, you have to move for family reasons. Maybe it's the job. That's not a great thing. Maybe it's just, you need a different location. You met someone, you need sunshine, whatever it is, you might need to leave. And so you want to plan for that to be as 
seamless as possible, that you're as protected as possible. You can do without cause termination, and usually the employer can as well. And so that's just saying you give your notice, whatever they specify, 60 days, 120 days, I see some as 180 days. You want to make sure that you're giving the appropriate notice window to the right person um, in the right way. Maybe it's a written letter instead of just an email. And um, you don't have to give a reason for that. And then you, you, you do still work the remaining days. Keep in mind, if you do not have a job lined up um, or they might you know, terminate you without cause, generally you're looking at minimum 90 days to start a new job, minimum. That's like if you've maybe already identified one and already have a state license and all you have to do is the credentialing, like the credentialing is gonna be a solid 90 days. So think about that when you see those numbers, if you see something closer to that 30 to 60 range, if you, you were not the one planning on that, it's fast. It's really, really fast. And you're definitely having time off in between. So be prepared for that. You know, have a little, little, you know, uh, savings account for that one. Um, they generally do list immediate termination clauses. Usually they're very egregious and logical reasons. Like you committed a murder or, you know, lost your license or something like that. Um, so things to think about. Most importantly, when you think about termination, think about the costs of it. So some of the um, dollars you may have to pay are one that tail insurance that we talked about, if that wasn't covered by your employer. So being prepared for that 10, 20, $50,000 bill, um, you might have a payback. So if you got a signing bonus, a relocation bonus, a student loan repayment, those, if you did not stay the amount of time, which is usually two years, oftentimes three, and I've seen some as long as six years, that's the longest one that I've seen, you may need to pay that back either in full or better is prorated. So if you stayed two of the three years, you're only paying back one third of that bonus. Keep in mind, any of that money you received was seen as income. And so it was taxed as income. When you were paying it back, you were paying it back in full. So if you got a $30,000 signing bonus, say it looks like 15,000 as a check after all your federal and state taxes come out, and then you leave six months later and they want that full 30,000, well, you're going to have to find another 15,000 of your own to pay that back. You can work with your accountant and try to get some tax breaks or something like that. Um, I don't know how to do that but wouldn't count on it. And just understanding that difference there. Um, I had that come up in one job and thankfully it was a very small signing bonus, which is often what I try to aim for because I don't want to be in that position. Um, but it does hurt when, when you need to do that. And then when it comes to your contract, there's always going to be give and take. So overall, you want to join the practice. They want you to join. Everybody wants to work together. Um, everybody's goals and values might be a little bit different. So try to understand what matters to you and try to understand what matters to them and try to find common ground. So you might give up a little bit in compensation in order to have a more flexible non-compete, or you might get a little bit more vacation time and drop your base salary something like that. You have to see where their wiggle room is and then what you feel comfortable with. And then I do always encourage physicians, know your non-negotiables. We always talk about how these hospital systems and employers say, this is non-negotiable. This is our contract. They put their foot down. They have non-negotiables. It's okay for you to have that too. If you at some point get to, uh, you know, this, this contract, this negotiation, and you're realizing it's just it's not even just a matter of compromise at this point. You're just on different pages. It's okay to walk away. There are a lot of jobs out there and I know it's scary because it doesn't always feel that way when you're in the moment and you were really excited. And of course, we always want everybody to get the job that they want. But if you get to the point and you realize this isn't a good fit, we don't have the same values. They're not going to meet the needs that I have. You don't want to start off like feeling undervalued and resentful towards them. So just keep in mind, it is okay to walk away which gets a little bit into the negotiation. So having a BATNA is really important. Uh, that's a best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So that's your backup plan. What happens if this job doesn't work out? Nobody wants to go into a negotiation feeling desperate because that's where you start to bend on some of your own personal values and um, you know can put yourself into a sticky situation. So having a backup plan is really important. That could be another job that you were like, yeah, that was a decent one. I, I'd like this one to work, but that was a good one. That's a good backup. 
Um, or it could be going to locums work, or it could be going backpacking across Europe because most of them, us didn't take the time for that. We just, you know, went straight through for school. So maybe it's time to breathe and do a little hiking. Um, there's just a lot of different options out there. Um, so try to feel that sense of empowerment that I encourage everybody to have and, um, realize that this one job is not going to be the be all and end all. So, um, keeping that in mind. Again, we don't want you to feel like a winner loser situation. Like I was saying before, everybody has the shared goal of let's um, let's come to an agreement. Let's work together. This is what we want to be doing for the next few years, decades, however long you want to be there. And then sometimes we're doing more um, clarification than negotiation. So sometimes you just need to ask questions. What is this? clause mean? What situation has it come up in? Tell me what would happen if I broke a leg, blah, blah, blah. How does all of this work? And then once you get all that information, if it doesn't make sense in the contract, maybe you need to negotiate a more um, detailed language. Um, or if it doesn't stand for what you want it to, maybe that that's where you need to negotiate something there. So keep in mind, not everything has to be an ask for something different. Sometimes it can just be an ask to better understand. Different contract types, different position types, academic, hospital, employee, private practice, they're going to ha each have different areas of wiggle room where they can negotiate, where they're going to have a pretty hard line. Everybody's signing the same clause. We do this all the time. So we're generally pretty able to help you understand where we're going to have some wiggle room so that you're not, you know, driving your head into the wall, not getting anywhere when there was something else that we could have worked on. And then for anybody who is already in a practice and maybe you are on a salaried model or you all kind of have the same production type model, there's power in numbers. So if you as a group are feeling like, hey, these, this doesn't make sense, our schedule doesn't make sense, our compensation doesn't make sense, you can work together to come up with a plan to renegotiate. Um, that is something we also help guide physicians through if that's something that you want support on and want that MGMA data, all of that information as well. And again, think budget cycles when you're doing that. Red flags, basically I'd summarize all these flags too. If it's vague, it's a red flag. So you want things as spelled out as possible so that there's no room for interpretation. You might have one CMO or admin or whoever today who reads it one way. And then in three years, when you're trying to terminate or renegotiate or something comes up, it's a whole different team and they're reading it a different way. You want to try to prevent that as much as possible. So try to get as much in writing as clear as possible. Um, ways you can prepare. One, use a contract review specialist. This is what we do at Contract Diagnostics. We are happy to help with this. Um, some people prefer to use like a contract attorney. We actually do have a lot of attorneys who do work there, but if you're looking for a lawyer to redline, most physician or most um, employers don't want that anymore, but that's always an option. Just make sure you're using a physician contract review specialist. That's all you want them doing. <laughs> you don't want somebody who's like a divorce attorney and does this on the side. Um, and then uh, we have a lot of PDFs, like I was mentioning. And we also, uh, if you're looking for a good read, I love Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. I know Jordan has heard this one before because I never changed this slide because I think it's so good. It's a great audiobook. It's a good read. He's got a master class now. He was an FBI hostage negotiator who took all of the tips he learned in his hostage, hostage negotiation training and now applies it to business and life in general. So it's a really, really good read. It's a great way to get some tips and you don't have to practice it first thing on your contract, but if you read the book now, you, when you're buying a car or, you know, negotiating your next mortgage or house or whatever, use some of these tips. It's great. These are just a screenshot of some of the PDFs that we have. If you have questions or you're looking for more information, don't hesitate to reach out. We're, these are just free. So we'll happily send them to you. We just don't have them on our website yet. Um, we do have all the blogs on the website though. So you can feel free to scroll through those. And then we do hear a lot of physicians say, oh man, I really wish I talked with you three years ago. Um, we're glad you're here now. We're glad you're hearing this. And hopefully this gives, just gives you that sense of feeling a little bit more empowered, a little bit better educated on some of these terms so that you feel ready to go through this. And then we're here for you now. So these are all of our um, contact info, my direct email, John, and then our general email. They have these new QR codes. So it takes you to the page if you want something on there. And I'll leave that up while we do the Q&A. Great. Thanks so much, um, Catherine. Definitely informative as always. Just a couple um, things that came to my mind I wanted to throw out. 
I mean, when people are throwing some questions in the in the chat or, or coming up with their own questions, I think in I, I mentioned earlier and I just renegotiated my contract. I used compensation uh, RX, and that was really the only thing I did differently than my first one. And I will say it was a huge benefit because I went in with just a very specific idea of what physicians in my age range, in my area, in my specialty at, uh, you know, as a hospital employee, what they were making. And so, and then I had my own numbers. And so I was able to go in and say, look, this is, this is just what I deserve and felt very confident when they offered me less than that of saying, no, I am not this. Look, this is what, this is what the average person is making. This is what I'm doing. You know, this is the range uh, that I want. And then ultimately getting that. I think um, when I initially negotiated my contract, I had negotiated it without a non-compete. So no non-compete and, and took a little bit less money for doing that. I was in a situation where I was moving home and, and we were really kind of established in this area. That gave me a ton of negotiating power this time around because it was very easy to say, and there were other places that that wanted me to join them and to say, look, I, if you don't, that's fine. I'll just go to these other places that do want it. And so I taking that little bit of a money hit up front paid off later on um, and will continue to. And then the last thing, which is kind of crazy, but I recently had someone, they were, um, they just became an attending. This was in plastic surgery. They did a fellowship. It was an accredited, accredited fellowship, but it was with a private practice and the, the malpractice insurance covering him during his fellowship was a, a claims based and they did not offer a tail to him. And he did cases independently as a fellow. So then he was in this position of like, buying this super expensive plastic surgeons have, have pretty expensive tails as well. Um, you know, like high five figure tail insurance coming right out as an attending where he didn't have that money, obviously, um, or kind of just risking it for these, you know, independent cases he does as a fellow, which I just thought that was kind of a crappy thing that the, the fellowship put him in that situation. And, and so just something, I don't know if there's any residents on here, but just to, um keep in mind so anyway with, with that um i'll say colton has asked uh who do we reach out to get those faq forms on one of your final slides you shared yeah um so we'll i'll send and jordan will help me arrange this but i'll send a follow-up email to everybody who's on here and it'll have a couple of the pdfs linked and then the info at contract diagnostics so you can email for them. If you email me, I'll forward it to, you know, I'll either send them to you or can forward it to them to make sure that you get them. So pretty much anybody you can reach out to and we'll get those too. Like I said, they're all free. Um, how much negotiation room is there for larger organizations such as Kaiser? How, uh, I think this is the same question. As I gain more seniority, it seems like I'm topped out. And at the end of the day, at least in primary care quality, it doesn't matter because everyone is so backed up. They know they can plug in just about anyone and they will have a full schedule knowing that there's such a shortage of PCPs. Any recommendations for thoughts on old trends for generalists? Okay, so for the negotiation room for larger organizations such as Kaiser, um, generally in these bigger organizations, which it seems like they're just getting bigger and bigger all their time, there's been so many mergers during COVID, they're really trying to streamline contracts in general and the contracts themselves become non-negotiable. However, they personalize them through amendments. Uh, most of these, I, I can't, I don't actually know if I've done a Kaiser contract with anybody. I know we have done a ton through contract diagnostics. I don't know if I personally have, um, but just in general, from what I know from other large organizations, it's really important to do your due diligence and make sure you know the language that's in there. So you know what your termination clause is, you know how you know things are spelled out in there. If there's exclusivity clauses, if you were hoping to do some locums, tenons on the side or something, that it doesn't block that. So that part is important to understand, but not going to be, it, you can't redline those. Like they're, they want every physician signing the same one, but they do personalize them through their amendments. So usually that's where your compensation comes in. Your schedule might come in there. Um, 
the uh, if you have some sort of call amendment or supplemental like a, if you're doing additional shifts if you want additional um like when i do my global health work i usually work on trying to get amendments in my contracts to protect time for that or to use different funds like cme funds for that um that's where you can get your personalization so don't forget about those don't forget about those amendments um, that's where you get to do your more of your negotiating and then with the contract itself the one that everybody signs that's your clarify, make sure you understand it. Overall trends for generalists, you know, there's so much change right now. I don't know what direction we're, we're going to go, but with the, the shift to value, we might see more of the salary work, people being paid off of time. There's definitely so many different places. They want to double book, triple book, get as many patients in as you can. And that's where, when you're doing your negotiations, if you can set um, boundaries for yourself up front. Great. Otherwise, if you're already in the situation and this is what you're say seeing, then looking at ways that you can start to renegotiate. Um, the, yeah, I mean, like RVUs are not going in any fantastic directions for primary care or for, for OBGYNs. I see, although we did see some shifts in the CMS RVU rates, improving more for um, primary care than relative to surgical subspecialties. So we'll kind of keep an eye on it each year. There's always some sort of little amendment in there. Um, I'm being offered ownership in my private practice. I've seen their PL statements and the fixed and variable expense breakdowns for the partners. The numbers are complicated. Do you recommend an accountant, consultant, or attorney to help me analyze and negotiate? Um, ex I, without knowing your whole situation, it might be useful to do one of our free consultations just to get a little bit more information and see if that's something that we would help you with. If you're looking at like income statements, uh, working with an accountant is probably the most helpful. The, the practice usually has an accountant that can go through a lot of this with you um, and they shouldn't be biased. I mean, they should be willing to just explain what all of these numbers look like, where they're all coming from. They probably be your best resource. Um, and then if you, and then if there's a contract associated with joining the private practice, that is definitely something we could help negotiate. If they're looking for like full on red line, they want you to write something yourself. That's generally where an attorney would come in handy. So for you, David, it might be helpful to do the, the free consultation just to break down a little bit more about what you're looking for and see what we could do to help with that. Um, is there an approximate worth for overseeing each nurse practitioner and PAs? Uh, I don't know if there's new data for 2023, but uh, previously it was usually around 500 bucks a shift, I believe. Um, but it depends where you are. So if you're at an academic institution, they may not do that. If you're not, if you're on a salary model, they may not have an additional. If you're on a productivity model, it's certainly going to impact your productivity. And so you should have that additional rate there. Um, is there any data on how much increased liability an MD takes on for each one? I don't have information on that. I don't particularly know. Jordan, do you happen to know? That I don't know. That? It's an interesting question. I, that'd be a good yeah. Maybe a good study. Yeah, yeah. Um, how important is it to find a contract review that is used to reviewing contracts from your specialty, cornea and refractive surgery, as opposed to just physician contracts in general? Um, if you get too specialized, everybody's probably, as long as they do physician contracts, you should be good. It, it doesn't usually matter too much. Like we can pull data for more subspecialty. We do... I, I personally haven't pulled data for cornea and refractive surgery, but um, we can pull specific data from MGMA and they get pretty specific. So we can pull that for you. And then the contract itself is going to be generally fairly um, uh, easy for us to review because it's going to look really similar other than your specialty being a little bit different. And then if we have that MGMA data to help share with you too, that's going to be helpful. The tinier the field or the more subspecialized the field, certainly there's just less data across the country. Um, but I would say working with anybody who does physician contract review specifically, you'll be, you'll have a strong review. Yeah. I think, uh, um, I'll just add in really quick for, for Colton, like for me, again, the MGMA data was able to get really, really granular. Um, 
but even like with what I do, which is like complex microsurgery and reconstructive surgery, it didn't get that granular. And I think what was helpful is just, um, you know, I, talking with colleagues and stuff like that, that do exactly what I do and, and kind of getting a sense from them as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's really helpful. At a point. Um, and also as, you know, as specific as it could get as granular as it can get, if it can't get to yours, you know, you should probably be paid a little bit more than whatever you just got. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, first year surgery resident here, weighing pros and cons on signing a contract early to help get a stipend throughout residency married with kids, wondering if you have advice for or against this. So it has a risk associated with it, but there are definitely people who do that. If you generally will see the, um, places offering stipends in more rural areas. So if you're looking in somewhere like LA, chances are, you're not going to get a stipend, even if you sign three years in advance. Um, if you're looking in a really tiny area, then you are more likely or more rural area, you're more likely to get that stipend, which can be super helpful. But keep in mind, surgery is what, I think four years, that a lot can change in three years. So the practice that you see today may look very different three years from now when you're starting. Um, you're also going to be signing for a salary now. And the and so now you're starting off on a say they offered 350 now. And when you start in three years, it really should have been 425 or more a year. The stipend might not offset the difference that you could have had by waiting a little bit closer. So those are little different things to think about. Um, you can try to project and try to put that into the contract. Um, but just understanding the risks, you can understand what it would take to get out of that. So if you get mm -hmm. a couple years in, and you and your family decide, oh boy, that is not where we want to be, or that's not the group that we thought we signed on to. What's the clause to leave? You know, are you gonna have to pay back that whole stipend? What's that gonna look like? Because usually that'll have a repayment clause also. So it's a lot to think about. Um, I don't have a, you know, it's not a right or wrong answer. It's just what what seems like it makes the most sense for you. Um where what do you see in contracts where physicians get screwed most most often? A couple things. Um, tail insurance is a big one. The paybacks on signing bonuses, relocation, student loans, those can be really high and unexpected if you weren't um, aware of that, or it wasn't a prorated one and you stayed two years and 363 days and it had a three-year, you know, uh, maturation or forgiveness clause. Um, the other thing that we saw come up a lot more with COVID, maybe it was out there before, but I hadn't really seen it before that. Um, there are clauses now where you cannot give a without cause termination within the first, say, three years of the contract. They can let you go, but you cannot leave them. So you are locked into that you know, two or three year contract. And then you, unless there's a cause or you are able to negotiate with them along the way that it's okay. Um, but then you have to wait until your three years and then you can give your notice. So that can be really tough for some people if they were not expecting that. Um, there are some, of, also saw this a lot more with COVID, the, I don't know how to pronounce it, but like the force majeure um, clauses where they can change the contract on a whim if there is some something out of their control, whether COVID, a pandemic, things like that. Um, so being aware of some of those. The other one I would say to be cautious of is outside work. So if you want to do, maybe you have like a seven on seven off type contract and you were thinking, oh, and that seven off, sometimes I want a vacation, but sometimes I want to make some money and pay off more of my student loans. Um, some of the contracts will have exclusivity clauses that say you cannot work in the medical field um, unless they give you approval for it. And depending on the facility, they may not. Um, some of them, so then you can't do that without potentially being accused of breaching your contract. Uh, the other thing is they might say, sure, you can work in that, but anything you earn goes to us. So you don't actually get to keep it or you only get to keep 50% of the income or something along those lines. So that's something that I always just share with physicians, especially if they're, they do have a lot like a big mortgage or student loan and they're mentioning, yeah, I might want to do this side gig or this locums work or something like that. Well, let's make sure that's in the contract. Um, if you are, and I'm totally blanking. Why am I blanking on the term for this right now? If you are, uh, um, really into like developing your own product 
the intellectual property. That's what I was trying to think of. Um, they, if they have intellectual property clauses, if you want to be coming up with some pretty cool things and ideally retiring off of it, you want to make sure that you, anything that you come up with, you get to keep. Whereas a lot of times they say, like, if you're under this contract, anything belongs to us, or if you worked on it in our facility or something like that. So if you want to do that, probably working with an attorney to make sure whatever you're doing, it gets to stay yours. Um, I'm in a new job coming up to my two-year renegotiation soon. How do you account for value added to a practice that is not easily tracked, i.e. teaching, improved work relations with providers, hospitalists, ER that previously was extremely poor? Yeah, just outlining all of that is going to be really helpful as leverage. Um, you could try, you know, go through the compensation RX and see if we can think of ways to put a dollar value on that. If you think that is the language that your employer speaks, you know, that the teaching is bringing you know, additional, uh, you get to keep the students because they like working with you. I don't know, something like that. The residents are joining. Um, the improved work relations has increased efficiency and product production. And um, we're seeing more patients now more quickly and we're getting better quality reviews, things like that. If you can kind of put together that story for them, that's where you're going to to show them the value that you're, you're bringing that might not just have a, you know, a very clear monetary value. All right. Awesome. I think we're... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, these are great questions. Thank you. And I know we're at the end of our hour, but if anybody has extras, you've got my email there, our general email there, please don't hesitate to reach out. If you think of something afterwards or just felt funny asking it tonight, um, that's what I'm here for. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks everyone. Have a great night.